Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today on the podcast, we are delighted to have with us Machiel Clerk, who is a mental health therapist, an international speaker, a dream worker, and the creator of the Jung platform, as well as, most importantly for our discussion today, the author of a new book on dream incubation called Dream Guidance, Connecting to the Soul Through Dream Incubation. The three of us have had a chance to read the book, and we're all thrilled about it. We're glad it's out in the world, and we're really happy to be discussing the book today here on the podcast. And I believe, Nahil, it the book releases on uh, June 14th. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. We are recording on June 13th. So by the time you hear this, <laughs> the book will be out in the world and you can go and order it, which you should do immediately. Um, so in any case, welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with the three of you. I've listened to many of your podcasts. And so it's a joy to be a part of it uh, today. I am reading your book now for the second time. What I said to you before, I will try to express a little more cogently now, which is what a very, very readable, accessible book this is of how clearly you describe the way to encourage or incubate, as we say, dreams in language that everybody can understand, steps that everybody can take, and yet with with the depth and the subtlety and the completeness that this process has richly deserved, but in my experience has never had before your book. You know, why don't why don't we just sort of even back up half a step and and can we define dream incubation? <laughs> Mahil, would you would you just for our listeners just say what dream incubation is? Yes, it's it's a very old technique in which people proactively ask the dream for guidance on support for a challenge or a problem they have. They ask the question before they go to bed, have a dream, and then the next day, hopefully write down the dream and then, then work on it. And it is the idea that uh, dreams are uh, helpful to people on their life path. And it comes back in uh, in many traditions. You see it in the old Greek tradition with Asclepius, where people went to the temple for healing. Or it comes back in uh, Hinduism and in Islam. Almost any indigenous culture around the world has has or is practicing this. In the Jungian tradition, it is uh, it is familiar. And in my uh, journey to write a book, I stumbled upon a lot of people who noticed by themselves that uh, that you could do this. So it's almost like this is a natural instinct in people to ask something larger than ourselves for support. And we we somehow intuitively know that by times dream can help, dreams can help us on our life path. You reference the temples to Asclepius, which were really all over Greece and a big part of the Levant or that area of the Mediterranean. I think there were well over 200 such temples where people would would go and trek, make a pilgrimage to ask the god Asclepius for healing through a dream. Yes, that is right. It was, it was a tradition that was alive for over a thousand years. And uh, most of our modern, modern Western medicine is rooted actually in dream work and from that tradition. And people would have a very elaborate way of uh, uh, the pilgrimage, being at the temple, preparing for the, for the, for the healing night. And then working on the dream that uh, they felt that was maybe a direct encounter with the god Asclepius or a suggestion on how to deal with their uh, their challenge or problem. And it was very often an, an physical challenge that they came with. Now, in addition to that uh, Greek tradition, 
I see from your uh, biography that you have a background in African dream traditions as well, and that's something that you sought out and experienced firsthand. Can you tell us some of the stories of what it was like both to adventure forward and find this material and how you made sense of it for yourself? I, uh, I was born in South Africa, which uh, made me have a certain connection with, uh, with Africa. And on a certain moment, uh, about uh, 10, uh, 12 years ago, I started having dreams in which I would uh, return back to South Africa. I was in the plane landing in, uh, in, in South Africa, and I would be just filled with, uh, with gratitude and joy and, and, and be really emotional. So I took that uh, as a suggestion to return to South Africa. And on my uh, visits there, I would meet uh, the local uh, healers uh, called the Sangoma. And the Sangoma, they uh, would both throw uh, the bones, a divination technique, but they also would uh, would use dreams to uh, to look at uh, the situation of a person and fascinated with dreams i would have uh, have long discussions with them of how they work with dreams what they saw as uh, yeah what, what how was the benefits of it and uh, and they were very open to it especially they felt it was curious to be with uh, with a white person that was interested in their tradition and was interested in dreams so there was a certain kinship uh, as an interest in a shared other world. Now, in our tradition, we take on the discipline of the symbolic attitude, and we actually try not to literalize dreams often. I'm wondering in this other tradition, if there was several different frames that they would use to interpret a dream. One of the central aspects is that uh, the relationship with ancestors and so uh, ancestors would be referred to anyone that has passed on, uh, not only in one's uh, older generation in the, in the bloodline, but anyone. And it could even refer to spirit animals or spirit guides or other beings in the other world. And many of these dreams were seen as a message from ancestor to the individual. So that would be very often in the framework within which the dream would be seen. And then it would often be a, a combination that I noticed between some symbolicness, but also very often uh, literal assigned meanings. Uh, if there are horses, then it would refer to either a certain power animal, or it would mean that uh, something would uh, start would be happening very soon. So far more than in the Jungian tradition, I felt that the traditions that I encountered there were assigned meaning to certain, uh, certain dream uh, figures. So there are a number of different historic traditions of religious traditions, which I'm considering the Asclepian temples to be. And of course, there are many dream references in the Bible, for example, and the Upanishads, other sacred texts. So we have the religious traditions. We have the shamanic traditions of the Sangomas and other people around the world. And then, of course, where I think Joseph was pointing to, we have the Jungian tradition, uh, which is more symbolic, you know, certainly more contemporary, modern day and present, and we might dare to say more complete. I was really struck in, in the book by Machiel, by your talking about the other dream traditions. The other one that, that we haven't mentioned yet is you mentioned one in the Islamic tradition. I was really interested, you kind of dropped these tantalizing hints that you'd gone to these various places and learned from people and that you'd been to Asclepian temples and I almost wanted a second book where you would just sort of give us a travel log of your uh, stories about uh, traveling and learning about dreams. I wanted to hear more about that. But I, I guess m maybe building on what Deb and Joseph were getting at is, how have you synthesized these different traditions in your work? You have a method, a clearly defined method for dream incubation, how much did you draw on these different traditions and how do you meld them with the Jungian tradition that you're also familiar with? I, I didn't mention in my introduction, but you studied at Pacifica. So you've, you've studied Jungian thought and, and obviously are deeply steeped in it. So just maybe tell us more about that. Well, 
initially I started with dream incubation uh, to test uh, mainly on myself. I, I, together with my sister, with whom I share uh, dreams very often, and we would just uh, practice on seeing what questions can you ask, what uh, answers are coming, how do you ask it, what do you do when there isn't a, a question. Then I would start doing dream groups and, uh, and, uh, and, and with patients that I have and to figure out what, uh, what works. So that I first would uh, have a personal sense of uh, what I, that I created a bit of my own personal take on it. And I on purpose didn't read much or visited any other culture so that I wasn't uh, walking around with a, a bias and I would just build my own bias. And then I would uh, go to these different traditions like the Islamic tradition and, and study what their uh, scripture says about it and talk with people that, uh, that apply it and then and start seeing how do they do it. And uh, for example, Ishtahara, the Islamic tradition, has a set of rituals in which they uh, prepare for ask Allah the question. And in their tradition, it's very often uh, for a business purpose or for uh, a relationship, a marriage purpose. It could be applied for anything. You see that it is especially applicable to those life challenges. So then love and work, love and work. And uh, just like Freud said, life is about (laughs) love and work. (laughs) And how they interpret uh, the the dream, and uh, and what what I then started noticing not only in that tradition but almost any of these traditions that they they will all would have uh, uh, rituals uh, before you would uh, ask the question, and they all had their own specific set of rituals, and it, of course uh, as, as, as a Jungian oriented we would look at well maybe it's not uh, the specific ritual but it's the fact that a person uh, is engaged in a ritual. Then I try to make the aspect of ritual personal, personal to myself or the person that asked it or in the book, how do you create a personal ritual? And that, uh, and, and so there I was, there I have borrowed heavily on these traditions, looking at what structure they do, but uh, scraping uh, over the literalized aspects of it and try to find the spirit that lives underneath and provide that in a five-step process. Can you just go ahead and give a quick overview of what that five-step process is? Yes, uh, I can even give a very short example of someone that uh, that comes to mind. Is uh, I, I uh, recently uh, uh, talked with a woman that had uh, learned this uh, this five-step process, and she had acid reflux, so. She uh, went uh, to the doctor and uh, she got a kind of medicine that had some side effects, which she didn't like, obviously. And she decided to, uh, to try this method. And step one is uh, really identifying that there is an uh, issue that you want, would like uh, guidance uh, for. That sounds really uh, simple, but it's actually important to first figure out what issue do I want to ask. So step one is uh, identifying the issue. Then step two is uh, formulating the question. And uh, we'll probably go into it later, but formulating questions is really important. And uh, she uh, asked the question, how can I uh, cure and heal my acid reflux? And she wrote it down uh, in a piece of paper. And that was step three, to engage with the dream or engage with the phenomenon that you ask a question through a ritual. You can make up that ritual yourself. So she would do some sage, light a candle, meditate, and then uh, ask the question, how can I cure and heal my acid reflux? Step four is that you then go to bed, sleep, hopefully have a dream, or just go on till you have a dream. And don't stop at uh, night one. Uh, Sometimes the dream comes at night two or three. And then in the morning, uh, step five, write down the dream. As we know, so essential because dreams have a tendency to evaporate and then work on it. And those are uh, the five steps. And I can uh, shortly tell uh, tell the dream response that this this woman had. In the dream, she's walking on the street, of in the street, and she meets a woman. And the woman uh, points to her and and, and asks her to come over, which she does. And then uh, this woman tells her, 
that uh, she should uh, take catnip. She goes like catnip. That <laughs> is so strange. And she thinks this woman is, uh, is a little bit uh, weird. And in the dream, she thinks, yeah, catnip that makes cats uh, go a little crazy. She wakes up, writes, writes down the dream. And then uh, the important step is she, she does take it serious as a response to the question. And so she starts looking up uh, what, uh, what might catnip uh, be. And then she learns that it actually is an herb that uh, sometimes is used uh, with uh, little children to uh, cure tummy issues or acid reflux. You can make an, uh, make a tea from it. And uh, so she ordered catnip, made the tea, and after a week, her acid reflux uh, started to go away. And I, I thought, gosh, what a, what a beautiful uh, example of how the dream is actually interested in helping us with problems that we have or challenges and uh, uh, can provide a really uh, beautiful solution for it. A, a couple of things come up for me about about that, uh, which is, first of all, I love, and you spend a lot of time in the book talking about this, and I really loved it, that the dream is interested in helping us. You even mentioned that this this kind of mysterious larger awareness that's behind the dream and how it's sort of standing ready to answer our questions and our our prayers, if you will. And it was just lovely. It was beautiful, beautiful language. And I, you know, as someone who works with client dreams daily, I I couldn't agree more that the, the dreams are interested in helping us. The second thing that's interesting, and it really comes up in your example, is it seems to me that perhaps dream incubation dreams are slightly different than dreams that we spontaneously have and require somewhat of a different approach in terms of interpretation. It's, it's almost like they're a bit more literal or to the point or, uh, have a sort of just so quality about them. Would you agree with that? Do you feel that it's, uh, sort of a different task to work with a dream incubation dream than a spontaneous dream? Yeah, I, I, it, it already starts with when when you talk about the interpretation that I think that if we ask this larger awareness a question, we at least should honor the dream response as uh, if it is an answer back. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we would read that dream against the question. Yeah. And a normal spontaneous dream, you you wouldn't you wouldn't start thinking how does this solve my uh, my acid reflux or and and I think it might answer on, on multiple levels. The dream is very uh, intelligent that way. But at least at one level, it, it answers our question. So that, that puts it in immediately in, in a certain, uh, in certain uh, framework to think about a dream. What I've also noticed is that the more a person has already done some of their own homework before they ask the question, and they've really exhausted their, uh, their, their day-to-day uh, search for the answer, the more literal the dream starts becoming on the moment that they, uh, they ask the question. If they ask it, it, it can still be very symbolic and, and, and in that way, but there are times that the dream is very straightforward in, uh, in its suggestion. Hmm. That's interesting. Machiel, I'm curious how you imagine the intelligence behind the dream. You mentioned that it's, a larger awareness. You'll say that the dream has an intelligence, but what are the various ways that you image the intelligence behind the dream? Yeah, that's a great question. I uh, try to refer it as uh, as the mystery, so that I don't uh, build up too many uh, preconceived notions of uh, what this uh, exactly is. But what it uh, uh, does seem to uh, show to to me is that it has features as uh, being uh, being deeply intelligent, being aware of our life, that it seems to know uh, who we are and what we are supposed to become, that it uh, finds uh, uh, extremely creative solutions for uh, our life. Uh, it it is uh, it it helps us, and not only us, but in a, in a larger tapestry create patterns that are uh, uh, brilliant and uh, that we're better off seeing what it, uh, how it wants to flow versus that we put our own will uh, onto it. 
uh, by times it uh, can be uh, very uh, consoling and, uh, and compassionate. And of course, uh, it, uh, it leaves some of the riddles of uh, where, uh, where do all the troubles in the world then come from. They seem to be woven into somewhere in the way it created uh, uh, or it is the creation of, uh, of everything. That there is, as Jung says, an inner companion or a companion that is a mystery ultimately that we can access within ourselves. I remember um, a million years ago when I first read Jung and he talked about the inner companion and the treasure hard to attain. I thought, oh, wow, you know, I want that. What is that? Where is it? How do I get it? And that, that here it is available to us, so available to us uh, through our dreams and everybody dreams. Exactly. It, and, and I remember um, also that Jung said somewhere that uh, he calls it the two million year old man yes. that uh, is available for us. And then he says a little bit later in an interview, and uh, it uh, talks to us through dreams. Or where do we access this, uh, this man or woman in, uh, in our dreams? The dream life is, uh, is, is present. And uh, one of these things that I think like the dreams are and like the unconscious it's not only available at night it's just present all the time and it uh, seems to uh, respond to uh, us relating to it if we turn towards it it uh, it it engages more and otherwise it it has the free will that allows us to make our own choices and uh, it seems to be okay with that and i think that we are just better off if we ask it for uh, its participation, because it, uh, it can be so beneficial for life purpose, happiness, uh, joy. What I'm really appreciating about your response to Joseph's very uh, important question is just how um, sort of phenomenological you are. Like you're just saying what you've learned and what you've noticed, which is very much the way Jung approached these big metaphysical questions. There's so much we can't know, but you can observe repeated patterns in our own lives or in the lives of our clients and see just the kinds of things that you're talking about, that there's this, this greater intelligence that seems interested in us, that seems to be able to come up with these elegant, eloquent answers to questions. And we can trust that and, and proceed with it, even without there being sort of proof, as it were, there's, you know, kind of empirical evidence of this. No, there's the experience of it. And, you know, Jung had that experience. You've had that experience. I've had that experience. This is something that we can, we can trust. We can wrap it with our knuckle and it has a really solid sound because it consistently gives answers that we can use. Along that same line, I was thinking about how in the course of our studies and readings about all kinds of things, we're exposed to ideas and we often hold them lightly. They kind of tumble around in the back of our heads. And then there's often a pivotal experience, almost an initiation that proves to us that something that we've read about is real and relevant. So I'm curious what was the experience that you had that took the theory of dream work and made you absolutely certain that it was valid and real for you personally? We'll, we'll go back a little bit in time. And that was in my early 20s when I started reading uh, Hume. And I was in a dead end in my life. I, uh, uh, my father had died at the age of 10. And uh, my uh, culture and family didn't know well how to grieve, so that uh, the whole grief was uh, postponed. And uh, so early 20s, I uh, had uh, become somewhat depressed and didn't know where to go, had no sense of purpose, literally knew that I asked myself, what do I want to do in the future? And it was black. I just didn't know. And I was, was really unhappy and started uh, dabbling too much in, uh, in the wrong activities. 
And uh, by chance, I stumbled upon the works of Carl Jung, and uh, uh, that opened up to the world of dream. And I started having very practical dreams that showed me where I was in life. Like I was uh, seeing figures that were sleeping in way too long, missing their work. And uh, uh, that was a, a good reflection, kind of an X-ray of uh, what, what dreams can do. But uh, a deeper uh, other uh, experiences where I would be reconnecting in the dreams with my father. And that felt so uh, numinous and uh, uh, gave me such a conviction of, oh, the world of dream coexists next to this reality. And uh, it's inhabited with, uh, with uh, the deceased. And there are beings in that other world that uh, start uh, giving information or saying things to, uh, to us that uh, are, uh, are very intelligent. Uh, that uh, that uh, that really changed uh, me fundamentally, because the dream started showing where I should instead of sleeping in too long, where I should go. So I started connecting to a sense of purpose. Uh, my worldview changed from a bit of a dense world where I had to believe certain things to oh, there's this other world of dreams, and that uh, that set me uh, that that made uh, the first deep. Uh, change in my life. You mentioned uh, the numinous quality in in dreams, and uh, I'm going back to what we talked about a little a little earlier of of how did you know that they were important? And uh, you, you say in the book something that is um, close to my heart, but how important it is to move to the second step of discovering what the dominant feelings and emotions in the dream are and how, that that is key to understanding dreams. Uh, we don't dissect dreams, but we have an experience, that phenomenological aspect, uh, the numinous aspect, that click that says there's a connection. But I'm just wondering if you'd say a little bit more about the experiential dimension of dreams, which is how we know. Right. And uh, uh, to, to start there and start very at the start of, of the dream, what, uh, what a dream uh, is uh, experientially is that we're in an environment, we're in a world where we encounter uh, others, a car, an alligator, a person, <laughs> and have an experience there. And I think that is so important because uh, 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 what I often read in dream books is this notion that uh, a dream is a message from mystery source X to us, almost like it is a letter that needs to be deciphered. But the letter is, I think, a mistaken, uh, is, is, is not the right metaphor because a letter is not a world. We're literally in a world mm. uh, where we have an experience. We see an alligator. We get scared, we run, and uh, that is uh, uh, experientially what, what, we, uh, what we have. And it is so real that usually only upon waking, we know that it is a dream. Otherwise, we're in the, in the dream thinking it is our day-to-day -day life. It's a real alligator. If we knew it was a dream alligator, we might uh, do uh, all kinds of other things. We could pet it or fly away talk to it or something else just to talk about the experience of dream that I think it's so crucial and that in the dream uh, we're actually uh, our mind is still uh, aware the, the mind is uh, is awake uh, during dreams we just uh, forget it uh, that uh, that we had hours of experience but the mind is awake and so uh, we have an experience that we then write down uh, when we uh, when we wake up. Then coming back to uh, the notion that uh, these feelings are so important, it's it's barely impossible to to really, as you know, to work with a person in a dream if you don't know how they feel about uh, their experience. If I meet uh, this alligator and uh, I'm uh, I'm not uh, afraid, that. Uh, puts a whole different interpretation around uh, what is going on in my life than if I see an alligator and 
I start f- fighting it or I run away from it. Uh, all depends on these uh, these feelings that we have. And it's also for people who start with dream work, you know, it's for, for you to become a Jungian, it's a, it's really a, a 10 year plus journey to do your own work, to learn all these mythologies and fairy tales, to understand these structures that dreams uh, seems to uh, pattern themselves uh, after. But if you start as dream work, just to ask, what is your experience? What are your feelings? We'll give you uh, tons of information that you can start with. And then you don't have to be uh, a scholar to to engage with your own uh, your own soul or psyche. I just think that is uh, so promising, uh, so um, enticing. This is accessible. Start there. You know what your experience was. You know what you felt. Yeah. And and that last step in uh, your five step method of then reflect on it. And, I, you know, I think we've all had the experience of if you hold a dream in mind after having written it down and kind of keep holding, uh, use your example of the alligator of like, oh, my God, what was that alligator doing there? Uh, that something tends to rise to the surface, which is more of what you're saying, of that uh, the dream wants to meet us, it is willing, and it is generous. Yeah, and and also very often if we engage with it, we we st- something starts happening throughout the day. We have, maybe have an intuition about the alligator, or uh, we see, watch a TV program with a synchronistic uh, moment where someone tells something about the alligator. It's almost like that field is then activated, and it comes through different directions to us, or or just a sense of the alligator, the, what the, what it was like to see this alligator, or. Alligators may be a more difficult uh, dream character, but maybe there is a benign character and you just continue to have uh, the character walk with you through day-to-day life and talk to it a little bit and <laughs> see what, uh, what happens. Active imagination. Active imagination, yes. Yeah. 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 It is if you do it uh, in a respectful way, all these, these very complex te- uh, things that uh, Jung uh, figured out and... Uh, 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 gave to us are uh, accessible for uh, for the general public. You don't. Uh, you everyone can talk to this uh, to this dream character and see what happens. And sure, we all need some common sense, but li- life requires some common sense. <laughs> well, exactly. Um, and that that that's the point. Really, is uh, for consciousness and the dream, the mystery, the unconscious, to be able to interact with one another. That it's not a one-way street. No, it is, a, it, it is just very relational. Michiel, what prompted you to write this book? I mean, what rose up in you? Because writing a book is, takes a lot of energy. Getting it published <laughs> takes a lot of energy. It can take years sometimes to bandy it all about. Yes, and I didn't know how much energy it took. <laughs> so that, that is helpful if you start something. Almost, I think that almost eight or 10 years ago, I started uh, with uh, the experiments. And uh, then I got so excited about it. And I, I always did dream groups. And then I did it in the dream groups. And, and it started forming in into a structure that I would do a, a, a talk or a workshop on. And then I thought, well, let me... Let me write uh, uh, this into a, a book. And then it uh, took uh, six years. And sometimes it was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, once you're committed, it's, uh, you're also finishing, uh, finishing it. And it's it, 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 it all with all very rewarding. And I'm also happy that I found a great publisher because that's also uh, then you have I had the manuscript and then oh gosh, now what? How do I get it out? It's another part that I majorly overlooked how complex that was. <laughs> yes, and it's being published by Hay House. Yes, yeah. which is a big yeah. deal. Very happy with that. You know, I, I've been familiar with dream incubation for, for decades, and I've, I've practiced it before, but it hasn't been something that I've done very regularly. And what I 
you know, going back to what Deb started with is I appreciated how clear and and accessible, but at the same time, you know, really profound your book is. And and one of the the things that it that it does so well, and you alluded to this a little while ago, is clarify how to ask the right question. And that I have found because since I've read your book, I've I've done some experimenting with your method and I've gotten some really helpful results and uh, I'll be sharing more about that in a few minutes. <laughs> but but why don't you tell us about about the importance of asking the right question and, and how to make sure that you're that you're doing so? Yeah, it, uh, it, I learned uh, it uh, along the way how, uh, how, how central asking the right question is. And uh, just to start when, uh, in the amplification of what you see in, in certain uh, fairy tales or mythologies is that the whole quest of the hero or the heroine lies in, uh, in, in, in finding the right question. Like in the Grail legend, the moment that uh, Parsifal asked the right question, it is the transformation to a new state of consciousness. In the story, the whole castle erupts in cheers because uh, not uh, actually not only him, but the whole castle uh, finds some uh, new state of consciousness or uh, redemption in it. And so that is uh, uh, the amplification to the importance of in our own life also asking the right question. Because I would do this in myself or with people and then figure uh, then notice because this this dream is is uh, convoluted or i don't get it and then i would uh, for example notice that i had asked two questions in one what can i do about uh, my health and where is uh, where can i find a girlfriend <laughs> now uh, uh, those might be two really great questions but if you ask that question and then take the dream and you read the dream against the question, you just don't know which, which part talks about my health and which part talks about how to find a partner. And so you, 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 you cannot really understand it well. So there's, for example, that I, that I learned through my own practice. Oh, you need to ask one question at a time. And then... Uh, I learned uh, things like uh, the dream is uh, not uh, very quickly uh, to answer a yes or no question, but the dream seems to be uh, uh, able to provide uh, a, a prognosis of where a certain pattern most likely will go. And uh, so that, is a, that, that also means you need to ask open-ended questions. What does it look like for uh, me taking this job? Uh, how does it look like to move to this city? Another uh, part that I noticed in, uh, in, in, uh, in asking the question, and here comes also part of my, my assumptions about the larger awareness behind it, is that it uh, 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 also wants us to uh, uh, explore and figure things out. Should I do this is uh, slightly too directive. Uh, it, it, if, if there's really free will, should I do this doesn't, uh, doesn't fit with, uh, with that. Then the better question is, what does it look like to do this? So I learned that, uh, that, uh, that questions that have to do with one's life path, one's individuation, that those uh, seem to have a very high uh, response if I would ask a question, uh, which I literally tried, what did my dinner, my neighbor have for dinner? I would, uh, I would have a dream, but it, it would, would be nothing to do with my question. I could not find in any way, shape or form an answer to it. So it's, it's, it's not answering all questions that we have. It's not like a genie in uh, Aladdin who just uh, is a wish fulfilling uh, spirit. It is, an, uh, it is an phenomenon that is interested in helping us become us in individuation. I built further on that and I noticed so that when we ask questions that have to do with individuation, which is not just an, an, an ego project, but the surface also to other people, that if we have a generous question, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, we get better answers. So the quality of the question really defines uh the the answer and then uh i think we just touched upon it as well is that 
it 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 also wants us to do some homework. If I just sit in my chair and say, "Gosh, uh, how do I find more uh, patients uh, to work with?" or "Where's uh, where's my partner?" or "How do I lose weight?" it 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 might think, "Well." Uh, why don't you first uh, uh, Google a little bit uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and do something. And then when you get stuck, then it uh, comes forward. And sometimes a little bit before that, but it, it, it doesn't want to be uh, almost used uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for our ease. It, it, it does want us to do our part as well. So, so there's a question of sort of reverence or having a right attitude toward the mystery. Yeah, that's very important. And then, so that I, I, I learned all those things that they that they are really essential in uh, in, in 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 how you formulate the question first, uh, when you formulate it, how you formulate it, because that would define for a big part the uh, the success. And uh, sometimes people would say, "Yeah, it doesn't really work for me." And then, and then sometimes it was very early on. Yeah, you you ask you ask the wrong question. It is closed. It is uh, not generous. It uh, it is too early. Uh, it's two questions in one. It has nothing to do with you. You're just curious about something. But ask a more uh, courageous question. It takes a little bit of courage as well. Ask questions that uh, uh, are, are pressing on you and don't want to go away. That you maybe uh, don't even really want to ask, like, oh, should I? Uh, what? What about leaving my job? Or how do I uh, speak uh, up in public? It seems like that right attitude is different from either wanting to command uh, the dream maker. You know, should I? You know, give me a yes or no answer. So that is ego or consciousness saying you're in my service and do what I want. Or the other side, like heads and tails of the same coin is just giving over to the dream maker. Um, just, you know, tell me what I should do. Um, I, I give up. Just um, g- give me whatever answers so that I don't have to do my own work v- versus uh, this partnering, extending, reverence, and taking the time and doing the homework, as as you say, uh, to approach the dream maker, the mystery, with a generous um, open mindedness, um, but but also an issue that has been thought about consciously enough to be condensed into a good question. And I, you know, I wanted to do a dream incubation, and I discovered after all of my years in practice as a Jungian analyst, it really does take time and thought of, is this really the right question? Is this exactly the right word? And so there is that wrestling with oneself. It, it's harder than I actually thought to formulate the question exactly right. Yes, the, the part, part of the the success or the whole procedure lies in uh, in asking the question that is relevant to your heart, then formulate it well, and then you get all the rituals to extend uh, to the mystery that you're really interested in it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember that, I write it in my book as well, that Einstein said, if I had a problem on which my life depends and I have 60 minutes, I will spend the first 50 minutes to figure out which angle to take to the problem, how to formulate a question. Because once I have the question, I will be able to figure out the answer. I think in, in, in therapy, it's often the right question that is so important. Uh, when a person writes a thesis, it's the right question. In business, uh, it, it depends on questions. Intimacy with, with, with your partner, asking interesting uh, questions that... Uh, are, are personal and touch upon one's uh, one's soul really opens up uh, the intimacy. So asking the right question is uh, is essential in in this work, but in in many many activities that we're engaged with. I want to uh, go to something that I I really loved in your book. I'm ch- changing the subject just a little bit here. There's this wonderful discussion of the diamond 
which is a, a topic I'm hoping that we can tackle on the podcast in its own episode. But you you just did a beautiful job of describing that, and uh, I took a t- took a couple of uh, notes on it. You write, the diamond is a guide who reminds us of our callings. It is our sense of having a talent. It is also felt as a forceful taskmaster. When we are connected to our diamond, we often have a sense of being in the flow, fulfilled and never bored. Other times, however, it feels like a struggle. So you differentiate the diamond from the mystery, which you capitalize. And I wonder how you how you see dream incubation in relationship to these two entities, as it were, the the mystery, which I think probably roughly translates to the self. Right. And then the daimon. When we're doing dream, dream incubation, what are we, who are we, who are we hearing from when we get an answer? Well, that's 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 another really great question, but it's also up for people uh, to to play with. So one way is who do you want to address? And uh, uh, what I've learned is that, uh, uh, and people can can test it. You can uh, ask uh, the tree in your yard, "Do you have a tree? Do you have a message for me?" And uh, you need to be interested in it, not just uh, overly frivolous. But uh, uh, let's say you want to, uh, or you asked uh, your 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 pet. I once asked uh, a mountain and a uh, and an uh, and an and an uh, hot spring if it had uh, a message. The way you start uh, your question is tree or pet or maybe a beloved uh, a family member that deceased and that has uh, you you maybe have a question for them. You can you can you can test. And as long as you do it with uh, with some respect, uh, there's no uh, no harm in uh, in just testing out what works for you because essentially I think this technique uh, is really aimed at establishing a relationship between yourself and, uh, and and the dream world, and it might just work slightly different in everyone. So they they just need to find their own specific uh, uh, relationship. So you could also ask uh, your own diamond diamond. Uh, what would you like uh, to do uh, in the near future, and then see what uh, if it if it portrays a certain activity that you had not thought about, or maybe you had thought about, and it's just a confirmation or whatever it shows. And uh, and you could of course ask uh, the larger mystery, or you could leave it open uh, uh, and just say dream. So you can address different. Uh, either different beings in the other world, but even different beings in this world to come to you and, and speak. And I think that, uh, yeah, based on that, that it seems that nature also is interested in, uh, in us uh, listening to it. I am wondering about uh, sort of the shadow side of this process. And um, is there one, do you think there's one of uh, someone asking for a dream and really getting images that are troubling, you know, e- even something more along the lines of a nightmare. Uh, and is that a possibility? Um, because this is a really very positive experience that you write about. But, um, you know, is there another aspect? Well, the, 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 yes, the, everything has a shadow. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, it starts with uh, uh, if you have the wrong attitude. It, it will reflect in, uh, in the work. The dream will not uh, overly nurture that we can become a little bit codependent upon, uh, upon the dream to, to figure it out for you. The dream usually will, won't go overly that direction is my uh, experience. In general, even if there is an, uh, a nightmare, that in that case, the nightmare uh, contains some insight and information for you that uh, you can uh, that you that you that you're advised to engage with and uh, figure out what what why would the nightmare come to me based on this question and then uh, take that uh, take that nightmare really serious and of, of course there's sometimes but it's really at the edges people that get dreams that uh, that uh, that are that they cannot really uh, sustain well but that is uh, 
th those are really exceptions of people who are maybe already bordering on the on the schizophrenic uh, aspect. But even there, I think if you address the mystery and ask it for guidance and ask maybe the right question, how can I be more grounded? That your dream will 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 often give a suggestion. Oh, for you, grounding could work in this way. So. It, I have a high tendency to, if you come with respect to the dream, that the dream is interested in in helping you. If you're if you're not respectful, you will get uh, more a shadow side. Like uh, indigenous cultures, if they would uh, kill, they would ask where to hunt. But if they would kill too many animals, uh, the dream uh, maker or the phenomenon in the in or behind the dream would seem upset. And would no longer uh, start. Would no longer give uh, give helpful dreams, or people would uh, get ill and think that that was because they were not in a proper alignment with uh, with the dream maker. So this uh, builds on um, the famous Jungian sort of saying that uh, turning a friendly face to the unconscious and the face you turn to it is generally the face it turns back to you. And also, even if it's a difficult dream or has some elements that feel to the waking mind like a nightmare of, wait a minute, what does this actually contain as information and meaning for you? It, it might not be what you like or wanted from a waking ego perspective, but still take it seriously. Dreams are certainly not meant just to scare the living daylights out of us. Uh, they are meant to tell us something we need to know. Yes, and, and sometimes, uh, like you've seen in, in your own practice, people get a dream, and that is just confusing to them because it has so much alien information in it that the ego doesn't uh, uh, understand it. But it doesn't make the dream uh, not valuable or uh, un un unintelligent. It's just the ego hasn't figured out how to uh, how to see and understand it. And and sometimes dream answers come from places we don't uh, we don't expect it. And just this week, as in the phrasing of the question, I was working with someone who asked the dream wanted to ask the dream uh, where is home. And uh, uh, in the phrasing of the question, I could hear that this person wanted to answer as, uh, oh, it's in uh, Kansas or it is in uh, San Diego. And I thought, oh, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's intervene here because uh, then you already have a preconcept notion of what the dream will say. And as we, of course, uh, know, the question of home is so, so fundamental, but it could also be, where, is, where can I find home in myself? But this person, I, ha I haven't heard from what dream came, but if, if it was just a literal place, you might have a dream that you wouldn't understand because the dream might very well uh, say something about where's home in you and not uh, on uh, a main street in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. So a better question, if you wanted to know Arkansas versus San Diego, might be what <laughs> what would it be like to move to Arkansas? Yeah, and especially if you don't have a preference, or you could ask a question as a uh, uh, soul, where 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 would we uh, feel most at home? Uh, see what uh, what the soul uh, is going to say, and and you can also ask multiple questions. So it's not uh, if it is uh, how does it look for Arkansas, and you get a series of images that are somewhat neutral and then you can ask about another place or but you would do that at a different night you would do that at a different night yes and then you just built an, an ongoing engagement and relationship with uh, with the dream and if the dream doesn't if you really don't figure it out i've i've had dreams that i couldn't figure out and i would go back to the dream and say i'm uh, uh so honored that you think so highly about me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get this. Please, please dumb it down. Please dumb it down. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I that surprised me a little bit in your book, and I and I I realized after 
after my experience of dream incubation last night that we'll talk about more in a second, that I probably uh, went over it too quickly is you talked about looking to your dreams to learn about having more fun. Yes. That this could be fun. So let's this talk about fun. fun. Well, I, I know this because I can get overly uh, uh, obsessive and, and, <laughs> and lose a little bit uh, the fun. But uh, uh, yes, you can. Uh, uh, dreams uh, do, uh, do also uh, 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 can be very playful. Life can be very playful. It's a really big part of life. And having fun is, uh, is important too. And so you can, uh, if, you're, uh, if you want even ask a question is, how can I have more fun? Or tonight in my dream, I would just like to experience a little bit more fun. And I remember that once I was uh, in a what, depressive episode and I said, oh, I would love to feel a little bit more lighthearted tonight. And I, I felt light, more lighthearted and that carried over in the day. And then my work to work on my depression returned. It, it was a, a little uh, moment, gosh, uh, and I feel invigorated to take on this uh, this uh, uh, energy sucking uh, state that I'm in. And some people are by nature good at it. Fun <laughs> can be fun too. Well, I want to ask you about another important dream that I know you had, because you write about it in the book, and you've also told it to me in our conversations. And uh, that would also give you a chance to tell our listeners a little bit more about the Young platform. So maybe you could give us the background on that and how a dream led you to do that. Yeah, that was for me a very important vocational dream. And uh, that was in uh, 2009. I, uh, in the dream... I am floating above the Lake of Zurich, about uh, 50 yards or so, very close to Jung's house at, uh, in Kusnacht. And uh, Jung has this house uh, at the lake with uh, the yard. And there was a dock uh, attached to his, uh, his yard, and that is also all there in, in, in this reality. And uh, then uh, there was an, uh, a square concrete platform that Jung had built or that he was working on uh, to his yard. And, uh, uh, and attached to the dock. And he was uh, in his uh, late 70s, 60s or early 70s, a strong, vital man, rearranging some beams to make it a little bit more uh, cozy. And then I see him sit on the platform reading a book. And I just observe all of this. And then it's almost like in a, in a movie, the, 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 the scene comes to a standstill. It then turns uh, black and white and grayish. And uh, Jung and the platform, they disappear. And I'm wondered about that. And then I hear a voice behind me say, now you have to draw it identical to how it was. And I think I can draw. I have a pencil in my hand and make a line. And it's more straight than I thought I could draw. And then uh, I woke, woke up. I took that, uh, that dream as a suggestion to build a platform for Jungian and post-Jungian and like Jung-oriented psychologies where Jung explores all these different traditions that are rooted in the unconscious or in soul. Initially, I said to a, a group of friends here uh, in Salt Lake where I uh, lived, uh, come, uh, let's build a uh, Jung society. And we did that. And to our own surprise, the first time there were 75 people and then there were 125 and then 175 and then 200 plus and we're like my gosh this resonates in the local uh, fabric that what is so dear to my heart uh, many other people uh, find uh, find joy and importance and meaning in we built uh, the young society of utah and then i thought why uh, uh, not to translate this also online because especially in those days and i had that uh, there was a harder access to uh, really great teachers. If you lived in small places, uh, uh, it was harder to find them. So we uh, started uh, creating online uh, courses with interesting Jungians and people that are in the Jungian tradition. And uh, we've been continued to build that. And then several, three, three years ago, I stepped away as uh, the executive director from the Jung Society and uh, four years, 
and really focused on building the young platform where we continue to create uh, summits and and we can highly recommend the next summit because the three of you will be in it. Yes, tell tell us a little bit about the the dream summit that's coming up. Yes, it's uh, an uh, an four day uh, summit, June twenty third till twenty six. It's for free during those days, and uh, access to the programs are available for forty eight hours. And uh, after that, you can buy an all access pass and watch it as often as you want if you intend to do so. But we offer it for free because we love that people get connected to dreams. You can go there on youngplatform.com, just enroll. The three of you are there and uh, Thomas Moore and Monica Wickman, another Jungian analyst, and Michael Mead and uh, different, uh, different uh, 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 figures that talk about dreams. So we uh, on Jung Platform create summits and blogs and courses, lectures, from entry level to a little bit more complex on Jung and depth psychology, and that uh, that uh, that was all born in uh, in a dream. So there's another reason that I encourage people to listen to their dreams because, my gosh, it has been so life saving to me, and I think I'm very uh, 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 average uh, that way. That it is uh, everyone has this, and it. It feels very special, but it is this everyone dreams, everyone is connected to this mystery, everyone has some talent to give to society, community, and uh, the dream seems to be especially interested in supporting a person there. And this fits with, uh, this is basically, I think, uh, very close to Jung's idea of individuation. We want to give perspectives and tools, especially we want to give practical perspectives and tools so that people can do this work on their own or at least the first steps of it and uh, and live a more uh, fulfilling life. Machil, I have uh, just an observation and then a question. In the last uh, 10 minutes or so while you were speaking, I kept having an image of you standing before a threshold And I've been musing on that. So I'm wondering if you are hovering close to some kind of a new, a new piece of work, but haven't stepped through yet. Well, it's it's, it's very interesting that you say that. I do think that uh, in one way, uh, uh, by bringing the book into the world, it's the end of, uh, of of a period. And uh, I hadn't realized how much uh, a new period uh, was beginning. So I think on one level, uh, I feel uh, that I'm in a transition there. On another, um, I'm uh, also in, uh, in, in analysis. And I think that uh, in, in there, I'm really seeing how much some of the childhood wounds are still playing out in my life. And finding a new way to uh, to to relate to that, and also there, I feel I'm 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 in a transition, almost like I'm moving from a young man to a man, at, mm-hmm. uh, at uh, in my stage, and uh, finding a different way to relate to the anima or the feminine in me and the masculine, and finding a healthy integration of the masculine in me, be a little bit less forceful and be a little bit more able to dance with, uh, with, with the strength there. So I feel that I'm also there in that, uh, on the threshold of, of moving into a new phase. And I think that, uh, in general with uh, the young platform, we're moving to a, to a new phase where we'll, we'll be expanding, uh, further. So a lot of parts feel like it's ending and, and something new is emerging and I'm getting ready to do that. So yeah. I think we're very intuitive uh, to pick up this, uh, this image. And you can formulate some questions to incubate some dreams uh, to help you uh, see the way ahead. Yes, which I'm very grateful for and which uh, is, uh, is so essential. Just like I resonated on that question that that, that, that woman had of where is home. And, uh, and and also for me, where the, the question where is home, and and I came really to the conclusion for myself that 
I, I, I needed to find home even, even more in myself. There were still the ongoingly, but there were still aspects that I'm, I'm, I hadn't dealt sufficiently with the sense of loneliness that I encounter. How do, how do I get at home in myself with this loneliness? And, and when, now that I'm doing that, I start noticing, oh, loneliness in itself is a whole world. And if I encounter with it, uh, it's not even that lonely. It's not that it cures my loneliness, but I learn in a different way to, to be with the loneliness. And so I, I, I find a deeper sense of coming home in, uh, in myself that way. And dreams are uh, one of the most essential uh, ways that, uh, that that works uh, for me. Are you an INFJ? Yes, I am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Joseph is our resonant typologist. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. I think there's something about the typology that um, cultivates a kind of exquisite intensity of one's inner and outer life mm. that strikes so deeply that it's difficult to even find adequate words. Yeah. So most of the INFJs that I've known struggle with that sense of loneliness so i can i can resonate to that i understand that yeah yeah you're an infj as well uh, i'm an enfj but i seem to be sliding all around these last <laughs> few years yeah. so i'm going through my own kind of threshold experience yeah yeah but i would say half of my practice are infjs so there's some kind of magnetic appreciation <laughs> yeah yeah i hear you Maybe we can, uh, we can work on a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply, as he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During dream school's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom, to enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. So I thought it would be interesting to do a dream incubation on the eve of this podcast recording to, to ask what needed to be brought forward. So my question was, uh, and, and Mekiel, you can give me some uh, feedback on my question. My question was, what is the most important thing that I should bring forward in the podcast tomorrow? I, I, I love the question. So let's just uh, as a start. And I am appreciating what we touched on, the generosity of the question, that it, not just for you, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what can we bring forward for listeners? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So go yeah. for it. Okay. So this was, this was the dream that I had. So there's a guy and he is maybe on a skateboard and I'm either in a bike uh on a bike or in a car. And I think I'm with Deb and we are following this guy and he is enjoying the speed bumps on the road and the twists and turns in the road. He's skateboarding and, and I have a somewhat superior attitude. I am just going very straight. And I think that we are exactly the wrong people to be following him because we have such different approaches. He, he and I have such different approaches, but I am following him. He seems to really be enjoying himself. Then we stop and, and we're somewhere else. And he comes over and he is speaking to me. It is very clear that he's attracted to me. He's flirting with me and telling me that he finds me beautiful. It is hard for me to hear this and it, it makes me want to kind of run away, but I, I make myself stay with it. 
I make myself continue to meet his eyes and I make myself say thank you and accept the compliments. I know he is totally sincere. He tells me he knows that one day I will be tucking him into bed. And I respond that I don't think that that is going to happen. He says he knows it will happen. I know that our lives are very different and he can't really understand mine. I mentioned something about almost having gone to college in the South, but there were no Gothic universities there. This man asks me what that means, and I am noticing how out of his league I am. Still, I can feel his real sincerity and my own surprising attraction to him. So I don't, I don't pretend to uh, know everything that that dream means. But one of the things that struck me when I first woke up and was writing it down was in the first part of the dream, the attitude of just really enjoying the journey of uh, having fun. And I'm (laughs) maybe a little bit obsessive. (laughs) I'm just driving very straight. But there's this other energy that uh, is able to just really have uh, fun in a in a kind of um, childlike way that's that seems to me really positive. So one of the things I thought was, well, I need to talk about fun on, <laughs> on the podcast and, and, and that part of the book, Machiel, that I, as I said, I, I think I sort of glanced over it fairly quickly when I was reading the book. And that would be very typical of me. It's like, oh, let's get to the more serious stuff. What's this about fun? <laughs> so fun was, was part of what, what struck me. Another thing that struck me in the second part, as I as I sat with the dream a little bit longer, and I mean, I've only been able to sit with it for a few hours because I I did just wake up with it a few hours ago. But w- you know, the sense that um, this man was sincerely interested in me and was appreciating me, and I thought I I wondered if that is a little bit like a sort of the the your point. Mekiel, about the dream world. The dream is interested in us. The dream wants to help us. And I have this kind of haughty attitude, like, uh, you know, you, you don't have anything to offer me. And nevertheless, here he is kind of showing up. Yes, I, uh, I well, I, I love these uh, initial responses and I love your dream. <laughs> and uh, I, I also think uh, it uh, is great to have uh, this dream because it makes some sense, but it also leaves enough room to puzzle a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think many of us will have a dream that makes some sense, but also requires uh, ongoing tending throughout the day or days to the dream to see what uh, what will uh, reveal. It's also a great encouragement for people that have a dream that is somewhat like this, that don't discard it, write it down uh, and sit with it and, 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 and let it simmer. I also uh, uh, was struck by this initial sense of you following this this teenage or, or the skateboard guy and who is just playful and meandering and and maybe that it also su- suggests something of, uh, of of the dream life that uh, it might seem uh, different and foreign to us and uh, strange and we might not uh, completely get it and uh, and yet it uh, it is. Uh, doing its own thing and it meanders it's not a straight path and it has fun and uh, it seems to be in a certain flow of its activities and and that that is part of uh, of of a way of thinking and engaging with the dream that oh let's let's come from a place of we don't know exactly what is going on here but let's see how how we can be with this phenomenon that presents itself somewhat as playful and skateboarding and different than us and doesn't meet exactly our expectations. I'm appreciating how close to the ground a skateboard is uh, versus a bicycle Uh, and that you do feel all the twists and bumps. And of course, we've all seen these skateboard guys and, you know, all the stuff and the tricks that they can do, uh, um, how much fun it is. And uh, such a younger attitude. And he's crazy about you. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's, that's a lovely other aspect, yeah? that, that, that he, yeah. he, 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 he is crazy. He's, 
he is uh, engaging. He says, we'll, we'll be together, even if mm. you say no, it's, it won't <laughs> let you go. It's, uh, it's insistent. Yeah. Yeah. I think the character reminds me of Hermes. And I would think of this as a visitation from Hermes. And the kind of skateboarding is a bit like flying, that kind mm -hmm. of fluidity in Hermes as this potent puer. And I was thinking about um, Hermes and Aphrodite were lovers, and their child was called Hermaphroditus. Hmm. And this issue of blending of sexes has been a topic of fascination for you in, in your papers that you've written and in other work that you've done. So it seems to me that this visitation of Hermes has could in some way be related to the larger arcs of professional interests that you've developed. And I the like, fact I like that. that. Yeah, that he's inviting you to a kind of intimacy or suggesting that could happen at some point in the future to mate with a god and to bring forward offspring from that could suggest a potent, inspired piece of work that is hovering near you. You know, Joseph, I love the idea of a visitation from Hermes. I have to admit, <laughs> I have never thought of myself as Aphrodite. but <laughs> He had many lovers. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely. That's a lovely, uh, lovely take on it. I, I also was struck by the the dream ego attitude of arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I think I'm a little better than, and I'm a little bit more sophisticated, and I'm a little bit more educated than this guy who just you know doesn't understand my 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 lofty preoccupations. And that seemed to me perhaps to be another thing, maybe to bring forward. And and we've we've mentioned it already. You know, Deb, you started off there talking about how how really accessible this book is, and and I have I have a confession to make. In spite of the fact that I'm a Jungian analyst, I I really don't like reading dense, difficult books, and I would much rather read a book like this. And then, Mahil, you were talking about you know, yeah, it takes ten years to become a Jungian analyst, and you have to become a scholar, but you don't have to be a scholar to engage with your own dreams. So I, I wondered if the the kind of the quality of this guy, he's he's a little bit of a kind of everyday man, you know, was was lifting up this aspect of dream incubation. I want to quote something uh, from the book, uh, if, if I may. You write, dream incubation fosters personal growth and moves away from any form of codependence on other people, books, dogmas, organizations, or substances. It breaks any form of dependence that is in conflict with a genuine loving relationship with yourself and therefore with your dreams. Dream incubation is your own direct relationship with dreaming with no need of the interference of someone else. The incubation dream is a personal revelation to you. And, and I wonder if my dream incubation dream is is commenting on that in a way that you know this guy apparently doesn't understand what a fancy university is you know i i don't know what i mean in the dream by a gothic university but when i think of gothic i think of something very old and european and you know this guy is like well what's that and i'm thinking oh you know <laughs> <laughs> He's so unsophisticated, but but the, but the point is, you know, you, as per your quote here, Machiel, you don't you don't have to have a fancy education to do this. Yeah, I, I love uh, how you uh, how you move there in the sense of uh, also this uh, this skateboarder uh, could do a, a dream incubation, and it would be equally effective, and the dream would be equally interested in him as in, in anyone else. This technique doesn't depend on uh, IQ or study, or it really depends on uh, your relationship to the mystery, uh, a certain sense of respect, a, a bit of courage to ask uh, the right heartfelt question and to dare engage with it. The technique and dream work is uh, for uh, for everyone. I like how you how you move to mm -hmm. that angle of uh, of this technique. Yeah. 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 
the, yeah. the dream is kind of like takes a like subtle pot shot at my conscious attitude of being a little yeah. bit supercilious. Uh, and I love in the dream how this young man keeps coming toward you. That this part of us, not us, mystery, whatever we want to call it, it takes an, a loving interest. And I love the ending of the dream where you say, still, I feel his real sincerity and my own surprising attraction to him. So at the end of the dream, the dream ego is warming up and going, wow, yeah, I like it. And um, I think that's the message we want to leave our listeners with. There's an attraction. <laughs> Go for it. It's juicy. It's, it's juicy, and your dreams are there anyway every night. Why not? Yes, why not? And also, if you haven't spent time with your dreams for a long time, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. always interested and it, it, it rejoices in any form of engagement. And if you then don't engage for a while, don't worry, return, pick up where you left. It's, uh, it's a never ending flow of, uh, of engagement. Machiel, I ask this question of almost everyone that we've interviewed. Is there something that you wish we had asked but didn't happen during this interview? Well, it, uh, it does strike me uh, in previous listening to the three of you and today that you all ask really great questions. So I want to thank you for that because that really opens up a conversation uh, like this. I think that uh, everything is, uh, is addressed and I want to wish people uh, uh, fun with uh, playing with this method and uh, experiment. You can uh, barely make uh, any mistake. If it doesn't work, try something else and, uh, and, and create this uh, relationship with your own inner uh, guide or counselor. And I hope people, uh, people have, uh, have fun and that it is uh, meaningful to them. And I just want to thank you for having me uh, on your show and spending time today. Yeah, you know, it's been a great pleasure. And once again, the title of the book is Dream Guidance, Connecting to the Soul Through Dream Incubation by Machiel Clerk, K-L-E-R-K. This will be in the show notes as well. For people all around the world, the book is uh, available. Uh, if uh, Amazon doesn't deliver in your country, there's also an organization called Book Depository, and they deliver books worldwide for free. So you just pay the regular price, and then they will ship it to you wherever you are in the world. And you can find more about it on my website, uh, machielklerk.com, M-A-C-H-I-E-L-K-L-E-R-K.com. Check out the notes that uh, come with this if that went too fast for you. Uh, there are the different uh, booksellers where you can uh, see for your own uh, region in the world where you can purchase this book. Get the book. <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.